introduce a really, really good friend of mine who will tell you what he is going to talk about. Um, I do have a clue what it's about, but he'll explain all of this. So over to you, Torsten. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, hello, it's great that you're here. Um, I'm Thorsten Ludwig, I'm from Germany, as some of you might know, and um, I have a company since 20 years working on training, um, planning and consulting for interpretation. Um, the last big project we had started in 2008, and the name was Park Interp. This is the homepage for that project. Um, this brochure you might know, it was um, announced in the newsletter. I have some of them here, and the main aim of this project was to create quality standards for heritage interpretation in German protected areas. Um, I will not talk about this, so if anybody is interested in that, we can talk about that later. Uh, one other part of this project was uh, to combine different concepts, and what I'm talking about today is based on the assumption that one of the fundamental misbeliefs in all industrialized countries is the belief in permanent economic growth, so it's quite a serious topic and it's a quite abstract topic. Um, as an international means to support the transition to a new paradigm, education of sustainable development was initiated by UNESCO and my proposition is that heritage interpretation can be an essential part of education for sustainable development and education for sustainable development can help to improve our profession, heritage interpretation. So this is what I think and um, this I like to support by five steps. First, I want to um, explain what transition means. Interpretation in transition was the title of the presentation. So what does transition mean in our concern? Um, what are the educational challenges of transition? This is what is most important for us. Um, what are ways to integrate the key contents of this whole sustainability um, and transition story, what is our current situation, and where are, are we heading for? So I, I wrote, what are the interpreters of tomorrow? And of course, I will not give the answer about that, but I hope I can trigger um, some questions in that concern. Um, as soon as one of these five steps comes to the end, there will be a red sign in the corner. So if your neighbor is sleeping, I ask you, please, <laughs> push him, <laughs> that happens five times, then you can get the essentials of the whole thing. <clears throat> so, what does transition mean? Um, I've stolen in the subtitle a title of a publication most of you might know, Our Common Future, was a very important publication in 1987, uh, which was um, written by a, a, a council under the head of uh, former president Brundtland from, from Norway, the Brundtland Commission, and they defined sustainable development and just took this definition because I think it's quite clear. Sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It contains within it two key concepts. The concept of needs, in particular, the essential needs of the world's poor, to which overriding priority should be given, and the idea of limitations imposed by the state of technology and social organization on the environment's ability to meet present and future needs. So it's about two different points, and you can put it like that. It's about ecology and it's about equity. These are the terms used in that concern. During the process of sustainability and sustainable development, a third term came in, which is economy. So we can say the three E's. And um, that's actually the term I think makes the whole thing a little bit tricky. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we can arrange these three terms in very different constellations. And most of you might have seen different models how you can arrange them. There's a wonderful book there. Um, from Samuel Mann, who collected all these arrangements and models. It's just a scrapbook, so he, he put things out from the internet and put them together in the book, and the book's quite expensive, but it's worth the price. So who is interested in that can see more than 100 models there, how to combine this. And of course, I will just point out a uh, few. The, the, the one which is um, mostly used is this one that says we have three pillars that are carrying the roof of sustainability or the triple bottom, bottom line. And what it says actually is 
that all these three points have the same strength. Pillars, three pillars have the same strength. So as soon as one pillar doesn't work, is too weak, um, the whole thing will tumble down. So it must be rearranged. And the tricky thing I said in terms of economy is, um, if we transfer that to our situation, and this is what our governments often do, um, economy, if economy is going down, it's clear that we can't invest so much money in ecology and equity. Yeah? If the economy is going up, then we can think about that. And so the building's working. Yeah? Um, but of course, as we all know, um, ecology doesn't care so much what our economy is doing at that moment. And um, the circumstances, our surroundings will change whether it's going up or down with our economy. So the whole system doesn't work that well. Um, <clears throat> I've, I show you another model, and this is the one where we were walking, working with in Park Interp, which is based again on this core econ economy, 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 sorry, economic development. Um, but it says that we have limitations. This is what the Brundtland Commission defined before. We have limitations. And the first limitation is the limitation of equity. So economy can grow, but it will hit um, a border somewhere. And if we um, not accept this border, there will be some effects. At the moment, the effects are that every day 25,000 children are starving. Yeah. <laughs> um, that doesn't harm the whole system. We can accept that. We can get, go over that. Um, but the next border will be the preservation of our livelihoods. And this is a very um, strong border. So if we go over that, it might be that the whole system is collapsing. So the idea is that we have to share and we have to save. This is the underlying idea of um, many presentations we have here in this conference. And so we are working with this model as it comes to sustainable development. I explained the other one because you will find it very often in official publications. So it is about limitations. And what I try to do in this presentation is I want to trace back many things that are um, brought up in concerns of education for sustainable development, sustainable development uh, to our profession. And so I was looking, where do we find something about limitations in our literature and uh, came up with this. It's a quotation now. What is my relationship to natural environment and the social scheme physically and as a strange and wonderful product of the evolution of mind? What are my limitations? If we do not know our limitations, our aspirations will soar. And you see these terms, natural environment, social scheme and limitations are exactly reflecting the model I've shown before. <clears throat> this was Freeman Tilden in 1975. So we can trace back these this ideas actually to our profession. Another quotation from Tilden, it was the same publication, explains why we need transition. For many years, our country, and to some degree, the entire world has been buying physical comforts on a credit card with the fond hope that the creditor might forget to render the bill. Not so. Nature is a lenient creditor of man, infinitely patient with his impertinent behavior, but insistent upon the ultimate payment. The bill has now come in. <laughs> this was the 70s, of course. <laughs> it was one of the last messages of Freeman Tilden, and you see he's very, he was very engaged in that, and you can imagine if he would have continued to work, maybe he would have, have ended up in a conference about global citizenship <laughs> and all these things we are talking about here. And it's really um, current what we are talking about because what we, what we experience is that our world is in debt. Maybe you have seen this book uh, on the table back there. I put it for the, for the auction. Um, this is a title from Freeman Tilden from 1936. He wrote a book, Our World in Debt. This was before he was involved in interpretation. And he was talking about these systems where you live on credit the whole time. Yeah that I discovered it two years ago, we're really <laughs> excited about that. But it's something which every day, every politician is talking about. In 2008, Obama said in Berlin, this is the moment to give our children back their future. It's exactly the same idea, yeah? So on the upper level, we know that we have to do something. We have to change something and we have to change it completely. We have to change our whole system. This is what the president of the United States says. Of course, you know, he cannot 
change the system from today to tomorrow, but I think we're on the right way. <laughs> so, push your neighbor. <clears throat> what does transition mean? Sustainability asks us to respect people all over the world, which means to share and to respect the ultimate ecological frontier, which means to save. To do so means transcending from local to global concerns towards global citizenship, and from past through present to future, towards future generations. Sustainable thinking accepts that growth is subject to limitations, and the term transition describes the transformation to, a such, to such a sustainable society. So I hope I have clarified what I'm talking about when I'm talking about um, transition. And now the question was, what are the educational challenges resulting from that? And because we are quite short in time, I just picked out four different terms and try to relate these ESD terms, ESD, Education for Sustainable Development, um, to heritage interpretation. First term is lifelong learning. As we all know, lifelong learning is important in a changing world. So what is lifelong learning? It takes place throughout life in a range of situations. It requires active citizenship and the desire for personal development. It meets different learning needs and learning styles, and it includes formal, non-formal, and informal settings. The question is, do we play a part in this whole game? And I think we do. The second term I picked out was participation, and I'm aware that um, the meaning of the term participation was changing, got broader, but please, please excuse me if I take Again, a quotation from Freeman Tilden from now from 1957, where he says, what is participation? Participation is another of those words to which interpretive activities have given a special significance. To me, it is elementary that participation in our sphere of interpretation must be physical. And if you read the whole paragraph, you will notice that his idea of participation is to get people involved, to get them moved. Yeah? That's a seed for what we are talking about today. I just listened to the presentation of Nicole, which was amazing, to integrate stakeholders, to get things moved. So again, if I would try to um, forward the thinking of Tilden in our time, I think we would end up there, where we are talking about at that conference. The third term I picked out is a very tricky one. This is competences. <laughs> it's very difficult because everybody's talking about competences, and mostly we are talking about competences in um, relation to DSEC or to the OECD and to PISA. Yeah, to evaluate the success of education. Um, this is not what I'm picking up now because we can't discuss that in a short time. I just picked up. Uh, one publication which, um, which was published by UNESCO last year from the Euro German UNESCO Commission, unfortunately it's only German up to now, um, and there are some criteria were defined, some competences um, to empower people. It's for ESD trainers, trainers for education for sustainable development, and the question is, um, what should they do to empower people? The first four points are very easy because these are the ones we just talked about, to see themselves as part of nature, to promote the idea of equal opportunities for all people, to see themselves as responsible for future generations, and to balance ecological, economic and social issues against the background of justice. So these four we covered in the first part. Then it says to bring sustainability to life by referring to examples from their own life, to balance preservation and change in terms of sustainable decisions, to question their own attitudes and interact respectfully with others to support independent learning and facilitate participation. That's what we're talking about all the time. And I think, again, lots of these things can be traced back to interpretation, to what we are doing in our business. And the last term I picked up was values. <laughs> and I related to this publication from the Public Interest Research Center from Britain, the Common Course Handbook. It's quite cheap, and I think you can download it for free and it's very worth to do it, even if it looks a, a little bit gray and not very exciting. Um, and they come up with um, this graphic, which um, compares intrinsic and extrinsic values. And the question was, uh, what are the values um, our world at the moment are, is, is steered by? And they came up with these extrinsic values, it's just examples of wealth, material success, concern about image, social status, prestige, social power, authority. And then they asked people, 
What do you think if you look in the future? What is important? What are the important points? And they had lots they could select. And almost all people came up with these points. These were the intrinsics. Affiliation to friends and family. Connection with nature, sorry. Connection with nature. Um, Self-acceptance, social justice and creativity. And the question for us now is, um, what are the values we are supporting with our, with our interpretation, with our job? And again, I would say there are more of the intrinsic values than the extrinsic values. And if you look at what the school does, mostly schools working, the formal education is working in this lower sector. Yeah, it's empowering the, the, the kids to get up, to be successful. So I think we have a great chance here um, to, to use that to, as a springboard for um, cooperation. So again, what are the educational challenges? Um, and the questions are in that concern, are we able to play an important role in lifelong learning? Are we able to encourage participation? Are we able to support the achievement of competences? And are we able to, to strengthen intrinsic values? So and if we could answer these questions with, with yes, we are, then um, this is a, a, a good um, signal that we can cooperate in a much wider level than we do up to now. The third point was, what are the ways to integrate key contents? This is a vast field and it just picked up some points and in Germany, very popular and it looks very old fashioned. I've only this old book at home. I don't have the English of the new. Um, was uh, Urban Systems in Crisis was written by Frederick Fester in the 70s, but you can get this one, The Art of Interconnected Thinking today at Amazon, quite cheap and it has the same content. Um, Frederick Fester was thinking, what are the fundamental rules which are important if we want to have a sustainable society? Um, and brought up eight fundamental rules. I just put the topics here, don't explain them, it's too long. But I just pick up one, you can scan through the list and you will, you will um, recognize several and you know why they are there. I just pick up the first one, the negative feedback, so he says, the idea behind this, it's relevant in ecological, in social and in economical um, systems. Yeah, it's all about systems. So the idea behind this, um, if you have a system which is working, then you must have something that regulates the system. And everybody who has maybe, I had one, a little steam engine when I was a little boy, um, knows how that thing works. Yeah, that's the regulator of, um, of such an old steam engine. Um, the pole in the, in the center is spinning, and the faster it spins, the more these two iron balls are getting up. And if they get up, there is a valve opening here, and the pressure is coming out here. Yeah? So the whole thing slows down, the balls come down again, and the whole process starts from the beginning. And if you're a naughty boy, you stop that thing working, and you fire it and fuel it, and uh, there, it will fall apart at one certain point, because it's too quick and the whole thing doesn't work. That is how our economical system works. Yeah, it's, <laughs> that's the positive feedback. It's growing, 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 and it will end up falling apart, of course. So Fester said, we need this negative feedback, and everybody must try to um, recognize this negative feedback in all these systems surrounding us, and so on. He does that for these eight different rules, of course. And what is quite interesting, to bring it on a higher level, um, well, this was, from this, from this rules, He's um, de detracting several uh, patterns, and he shows a, an example here how, how a landscape is working in a sustainable way on what happens if you put too many trees away and too many stones away, and um, then in the end the people have to go. Yeah, yes, that are ecological, uh, bio kubernetic systems, and um, there are lots of them in this book, so who's interested in there can have a look in there. What is interesting that concern is that we have an advisory council of global change, uh, change in Germany, which is a very important council because it's in a direct relationship to the government. And they came up with a report which was called World in Transition and picked up several of what they called syndromes. The council's underlying thesis was um, that complex global environmental and development problems can be attributed to a discrete number of environmental degradation pat patterns that are the symbols, I, 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 syndromes. I show what they mean. Um, you've seen this picture from Greece, yeah, with the temple. 
This is in that um, system the rural exodus syndrome, which means degradation through abandonment of tradi traditional agricultural practices. So if they abandon, the whole thing's going apart. So this is one of 14 or 16, I think, syndromes. And they have lots of others. One you might know is the Sahel syndrome. So what happens if marginal land is over cultivated? And what's important in that context is behind these strong pictures, and I think these strong pictures are quite important for us, behind these strong pictures are systems. And you see all different um, uh, concerns of life are covered by these systems and it can be complicated and more complicated and more complicated. And of course, in this report with 400 pages, everything about that is explained, but this is not so important for us. For, for us are these strong images mainly important. Strong images like this one you might know, yeah, um, that was quite popular in the times of Al Gore, <laughs> about the Aral Sea, the ships were, were, no, were there is no water, or um, that's a, a historic one, the Dust Bowl Syndrome in the 30s, where in the US the whole land was covered with dust and, and millions of people had to go away and leave their homes. Yeah. The question for us was in our project, um, can we reveal such syndromes on our doorstep? Because of course we want to work with original objects and original sites, so it doesn't help so much what happens in Africa, what, what, what has happened with the Dust Bowl in, in Kansas um, several years ago. And I have here one picture um, which was not taken in Kansas, but in northern Germany in 2011. Um, this was the same effect in, in a much lower scale, of course, but it was the same effect. Cars were crashing, people were dying because we had all these dust clouds going over the land. Yeah, And I have a Another example, one of the syndromes is the Katanga syndrome. Maybe you know Katanga in Congo, where they, um, where they uh, try to, to get um, resources out of the ground and leave complete devastated landscapes. And this is not Katanga, this is 50 kilometers south of Berlin. Yeah? So you can find the syndromes in Germany. But we want to go still one step further because we were working with rangers in protected areas and they should find them on the very side. And so what we came up with was the idea of ESD key phenomena. So do we find phenomena on site where we can um, reveal these patterns? So it's again adapted to the model I've shown in the first time. And then this looks quite primitive, but this is really was participation. We were, we, were walking, we were walking on our models and tried to create with our participants models with, 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 with which they can work, because we recognize that it doesn't work to give a presentation about these things and the people out there will do nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing. And so we were working in workshops together with them and ask them what, are, what is a model you can work with. And so it came to this model, um, which has the three different E's. Yeah, you can recognize it. And which has to do with the very place and the world. Think, think um, globally. And it has to do with past and future. So we have all included in this model. And now we were searching for um, objects or sites where we can hook on that. And one example for such an object could be um, such a granary where you can, um, where you can place all these, these points in the careful use of natural assets. They put the grain in there yeah, to protect it. Um, the equal share, that means that they have to bring it over the winter, the whole community. They had to share it somehow. They got big problems um, when they, they run short of their grain during the winter and the protective natural assets they had, um, but they were forced to keep something back as seed for the next year. They never would touch that. They would eat roots, but when they never would touch that, which was very precious for the next year. Otherwise, the children would have stopped, which is, yeah, thank you. The past, present, future, and um, this, this local global um, story. We can, you, you have seen these things in Skansen, yeah? <laughs> Several ones yesterday who was there. So we have very different points where we can relate on. And we can, I, I jump over that. We can do it with other things as well. What we did once was we created, this is a charcoal pile, a historic charcoal pile. We created a theme around that and we're talking about that along this model 
um, which was at that site, it's, it's, this is called historic charcoal pile, at that site children suffered from the growth of distant markets. That was what the, what the group came up with, and we were working on that several hours at that place, which worked quite well. This was when I left Germany, <laughs> and I just get, get rushed, through, rushed through that. This is a historic town, and it looks a bit, little bit like day after tomorrow. Um, and what I, why I show it is because I think that these situations are very good situations to get involved in the topic, because people are very open, people cooperate, people who've never seen before, and it's a good chance to get in there. And I've, I've had several pictures of good chances when we had the conference from AHI in Wales at that time. Um, this is a miner, and there were miners showing us their mines. There were other examples of Nicole um, in the presentation before. How, can you, how we can use key situations where people are really concerned um, to work with. So, what is the result of that part? How we can we encourage visitors and residents to recognize fundamental rules of life and to internalize worldwide syndromes? Um, at the sites they visit and at the places they live. If education for, for sustainable development in terms of heritage interpretation is to be successful with visitors, it should have something to do with heritage sites or objects as key phenomena on the interface of ecology, equity and economy. And if it is to be successful with residents, it should have something to do with heritage related life situations that make the need for transition apparent. So about our current situation, I took again something from the National Park Service. We don't have a mission, I think, which is international, but this everybody knows through interpretation, understanding, through understanding, appreciation, through appreciation, protection. And I ask myself, is that what we're doing today? That would be, we have a primary aim, the protection of our heritage, and we have side effects like economic benefit. And that would relate to the... Um, model are shown in the beginning. But what actually happens sometimes, I think, is that we turn the things around, that um, we turn our mission upside down, and that we work with this old model. And I know we have to do it in several concerns for economical reasons, but there are other places where I think we should never do it. These are our world heritage sites, and it's in the responsible of ability of our governments to care for these sites and to look that these different processes are paid by the government and um, that the, the own resources of the country are used for that. So our current situation is that our initial mission is turned upside down. I think you can discuss about that. And in a dilemma, we are often forced to deliver solutions that lead to financial success. In that way, we help to fuel this vicious cycle of permanent growth rather than encouraging interest, its transitions. And this last four questions for the interpreter for tomorrow um, are, does the awareness of heritage play an essential role in transition? This is some, something we should think about. Um, where do we see our responsibility as heritage interpreters? Where must we adapt ourselves and where should we hold our ground? And if we want to open to education for sustainable development, where should we search for partners? And my conclusion is that we are living in a world driven by the economic mechanisms of free markets and ignoring fundamental rules and patterns at the moment. And within our work, we have the chance to look out for key phenomena and key situations that encourage us to respect those rules and patterns. And my question is, wouldn't it make sense to become something like interpretive agents who are more actively searching for those patterns and who work on the transition towards a more sustainable future. Um, and I, I have that quotation in the end, when we blown off course, that was from Don Aldrich, who said, interpretation is blown off course. When we are blown off course, we should always try to keep our lighthouse <laughs> mission in view. And I have a last quotation that I think um, hits the nail on the head. It was one of the most important quotations um, for me the last year. The feeling of belonging in a changing world is essential to heritage interpretation, and it becomes even more significant in meeting the need for all of us to take everyone's heritage collectively into a shared guardianship. This is a very strong sentence, and this is the sentence um, which comes from Michael and which is very fits 
brilliantly to our aim and to our conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.